Welcome, everybody. It's a beautiful morning out there this morning. Um, do we have any visitors? Don't see anybody. I want to thank our elderly candle idlers this morning. Amen. Um, do we have any joys? Amen, Gloria. Okay. Uh, we had a nice group of men uh, yesterday morning for our first men's fellowship breakfast. And those are going to be every Saturday, or every third Saturday of the month. Okay. Um, and we're going to have breakfast from 7.30 to 8, and then 8 to 9 for, um, or 8 to 8.45, somewhere in that range, okay. for uh, study and work of God's Word. So. Feel free to join us. Next one's October 17th. We did have a nice group yesterday. Uh, any other joys? <clears throat> okay, and the announcements. Um, the 4 H'ers, I've got one. The 4 H'ers are selling uh, tickets for a 10 by 20 building, a steel, uh, like a loafing shed. So if you're interested, get with one of the 4 H'ers and, and uh, Tickets are ten dollars each, or uh, three for twenty-five. So get with them if you're interested. It's a really nice, really nice-looking building. So. Monday, September the 21st, is the Bible study out here and with Merle and Joan, and they're doing uh, 2 Timothy this week. Saturday, September the 19th, is 10 days of prayer begins with the Feast of the Trumpets, and then Wednesday, September 23rd, as Cheryl Lynn said, see you at the poll. September the 23rd to the November the 1st, 40 days of life prayer vigil. Saturday, September the 26th is called the return. It's a simulclass at uh, Ebenezer here. I might say something, Gary. Okay. So on both of those prayer the first prayer vigil night, the first Saturday in September, the one that I mentioned on the 19th, there are some prayer plans. Some of you may have gotten them. Prayer plans back there. If you want to join in prayer for our nation and for the world, it's, it's, the return is the 26th, but those prayer plans are kind of leading up to next Saturday, the 26th. And they go a couple days past the 28th. And then next Saturday, there's also a schedule of the different speakers that will be uh, simulcasting. It's being simulcast in the National Hall up in, in uh, Washington, D.C. And they've got speakers going on all day long. So it's kind of a come and go type deal. You can come, you can go whenever you want. 
But if, you, if there's a certain aspect of prayer for our nation and for our world that you want to hear, or you want to hear the keynote address, the schedule is back there on the table along with the prayer plan. The other thing that Calvin brought up, and I, I uh, didn't get into bulletin, but there's a group in Emporia that's also participating in prayer that day, and they're doing what they call the stand, and they're going to be on the four corners of Emporia praying at 10 a.m. on Saturday. So each of those those rocks that they put around in Emporia, there's one kind of down by Fanskills on the south side, those are where they're meeting. You can choose whichever, east, east west, north, south, whichever one you want, and meet there at 10 o'clock and play with them at school. So it is a, and Franklin Graham is doing a prayer march, so 26th is going to be a big day of prayer in this nation. Okay. And uh, as Christians, we ought to be praying for our nation and for our nation. Amen. I don't know for sure uh, what it is, is or not. Thank you, Tyson. Uh, Thursday, October the 1st, is Bring Your Bible to School Day. And then Sunday, October the 4th, we're having an administrative council meeting over here. And there will be no potluck. After Sunday school. Be right after, right after Sunday school. Normally, like it is, but there just won't be any dinner. Well, we may have to wait a little bit. Oh, okay. Get, yeah. Us, so. Okay, we'll figure out a time on that then. I would say we probably want to try and maybe come back up at one. I'm not sure Jeremiah didn't give me any more specific details. But I guess I'll make the decision. How about we do it at 1? And that way, we'll be able to get John back from uh, Madison so he can join us for the meeting. Okay, so it'll be at 1 o'clock. Yeah. October the 4th. Okay. And then Sunday, October the 4th, uh, is Life Chain. October the 9th and the 10th is the Ebenezer Fishing Tournament over here and the communion fish fry, and Doug had some flyers uh, back here on that if you want to look at it. October the 23rd to the 25th is a women's encounter at the cross. January 28th to the 30th is men, <clears throat> men's encounters at the cross. And that's, that's it. Does anybody else have any other announcements? Any birthdays? Anniversaries. He will have the children's story. All right, come on down, kids. Come on down, dog. Jesus. Who's Jesus? Who's Jesus? He 
detail here? You know which piece it is? Taj. He's the lost son. Good. All right. So you're right. I know you know who I'm talking about. A little bit shy. Huh? Okay. So Jesus is God's son. And Jesus decided that he was going to preach. God asked the question, who would save us from our sins? All the bad things that we've done, who would save us? Jesus said, I will do it. He put his hands up. Like when your teacher asks a question in class, and you put your hand up and you answer the question, that's what Jesus did. Put his hand up. He said, I will save them. So Jesus came down and said, what do you But while Jesus was here, he was teaching us some things. Number one, to be good, to trust him, to always follow his teachings. And so to live in Jesus, we must always follow his teachings. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of, how many of you are in uh, kindergarten? First grade. Oh, you doing it? first grade? All right, good. Now, what did the teacher teach you last week? Only one thing. our uh, gathering him majesty worship his majesty the call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing, sing to him, sing, sing praises to him, tell us all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let's seek the Lord and his strength, and seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he's uttered. Oh, all the strength of his servant Abraham, 
Give thanks to the Lord, <clears throat> call on his name, and make known his deeds to among the people. We'll have the opening prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for bringing us to the place of worship. Thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are with us in each moment. Thank you for your promises that are true, and your goodness that are faithful to us. In this moment, we come to you, and we lay our lives before you. May we worship and adore you, for we are glorified wherever we Help us to live our lives Jesus Christ, your Son, who will our work and serve and heal our spirits. We lift the prayer of our hearts for those still hurt, those seeking healing, those in need within the church and the world. And so today, we join all of those who worship and bless you as the Lord on the church of the past. The, epi uh, <clears throat> the epistle reading comes from Philippians. Oh, sorry. Opening hymn um, in the garden. <laughs> may be seated. Okay, the epistle reading today comes from Philippians 1, verses 21 through 30. 
For to me, to live in Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. For I am in the strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you for all your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by the coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may be here, <clears throat> I may be here of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and if nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me and now here to be in me. Would you please stand for the gospel? Matthew 21 through 16. 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers unto his vineyard. And when he agreed to pay with the laborers for one penny a day, he sent them into the vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle to the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever it is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand you here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, Go you also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the servants said unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they had came, they were hired about the eleventh hour. They received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. At least didst not thou agree with me for one penny? Take that as thine and go thy way, and I will give unto the last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do whatever I will with my own? Is thine evil? I evil because I am good. So the last shall be first and the first last, for many will be called, but few chosen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Good morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we glorify your name and thank you for this day. Lord, it's the day that you've made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Uh, before I go into uh, what the Lord has for us this morning, the first thing I want to do is that I want to present this uh, certificate for the mission shares from last year. So as you all know, the uh, district superintendent came by to just uh, look at our church, and she presented each church with their mission share certificate. So it reads here, generous persons will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. That's Proverbs 11.25. And it goes on to say, thank you for giving faithfully 100% to the mission shares in 2019. O.P. Ebenezer United Methodist Church, Great Plains Annual Conference, Bishop Rubin Sines, Jr. And this is also signed by A. Amos Rathen Coomer, General Secretary and Treasurer, and then Bishop 
Michael McKee, President, General Counsel on Finance and Administration. So uh, the Bible tells us that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so this is a testament of our faithfulness in giving to the church. So let us continue to do that. And this we will, uh, Sherilyn was uh, grateful enough to put it in a nice looking plaque. So we're gonna put it up there on the board for, for the church. Also, uh, I was fortunate enough to watch the OP football game, the senior high. And I'm telling you, when I went to the game, they, uh, there was a gentleman I was standing with and he asked me, he said, you got uh, any uh, kid playing here? I said, I don't know, I know I, know I got some of my, my church members playing here, but you know, they told me that they were on the team, but I'm not too sure what are they playing. And right after I said that, I heard the name. Damon Redeker, sack. <laughs> and, and after that, it was another one. Damon Redeker, touchdown. And I was like, yeah, that, that, that's, that's one of my uh, the church members' son over there. And I was so proud, you know. Uh, so I just want to give a shout out to, 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 to Damon. He did a real good job out there. I'm telling you, that, that, that team looked like they were riding on his back. Because every time, even when I left and I got the fourth quarter on the radio, and every time the radio announcer was a, a Damon Redeker and Damon Redeker, I was like, is he the one to play on the field? <laughs> you know, so that was great. And then I heard uh, yesterday, I didn't get to see the game, but Levi also uh, played yesterday in Emporia, and he had a false fumble and a two-point conversion for a touchdown. So that was that was really great. I mean, we got we got great athletes in our in our church. Now I haven't seen the volleyball folks yet, and I'm looking for y'all. I'm looking in that corner there. <laughs> so I'm I'm, I'm willing to um, I'm hoping to catch a, a volleyball game, but I just want to say that it was so wonderful to see our kids out there playing and doing well. So let us continue to keep them in our prayers. Amen. Amen. Our word this morning comes from the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians, chapter 1, verses 21 through 30. This particular book of Philippians, as, uh, as I, I began to study this, I realized that theologians have there are two sides of the corn on, on this book. Number one is that the first side says that Paul did not just write this letter at once. He wrote this letter and there, there are just pieces of his letters that he wrote and they put it together to form this book. There are some theologians that say that Paul actually sat down to write this letter while he was in prison. But my daddy used to always say that if a man does not know his birthday, that does not mean that he was not born. I mean, let's be real. If you don't know what day you were born, that does not mean that you're not born because you're, still, you're born and you're still walking this earth. So you can choose any day to say it as your birthday. And so I, I, I took that analogy and I put it in this year and I said, well, if one group is saying that, well, he took, they took pieces from here, there, and yana to put it together to make this letter, and then one group is saying that he was in prison and he wrote this letter, what, do, what difference does it make? The most important thing here is that Paul wrote a letter that was so important to our faith. And so in this book of Philippians, there are so many important things in there. And if you look at this particular uh, 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 section of scripture that I'm, um, we are going to refer to today, it's a letter that Paul wrote based on the, the readings. You can tell that he was actually in some place where he was held. Whether it was prison, it was the house, or wherever it was, but he was he was, he was not in a place where he was free. 
And so he wrote this letter admonishing Christians that they should live in Christ. But not only living in Christ, but it's regardless of where they are. They should continue to further the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so, as we begin to read this letter, Paul states here that it is important that we understand. He said, for to me to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. The first thing that comes to mind is that what is Paul talking about? To live is Christ and to die is gain. You see, life of a Christian is centered around Jesus Christ. And yet some of us Christians are not living the life God ordained for us. We are not living the life God ordained for us because of some of the things that we do that will condemn us to hell. But in the scripture, Paul talks about the struggle he is encountering. And this struggle is a good struggle. It's a good struggle because he's talking about whether he should live in Christ or to die and then go to Christ. So this is whether you, 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 you like it a lot or not, this is a win-win situation. Paul shared with us that life for him is good. And so he goes on to explain what life, what living in Christ is. He talks about life being good in the sense that if he live in Christ, he can further the gospel of Jesus Christ. He can begin to do things that will bring, draw more people to Jesus Christ. Also, he states that dying is also gain because when he dies, he will be with Jesus Christ. He will be able to sit on the right hand of Jesus Christ and share all his glory. And so, like I indicated earlier, this is a win-win situation. But how does that relate to you and I? As you notice in the scripture, Paul chose life over death. And so the case is settled. He is faced with this challenge. He is faced with this alternative. He is faced with this choice. But he chose life over death. The case is settled, but not so fast. Paul goes on to explain his decision why he chose life over death. And so he goes on to explain to us that to live in Christ, there will be certain things that he will encounter, but notwithstanding, he would rather live to further the gospel of Jesus Christ than die and just go and be with Jesus Christ. And so allow me to share with you uh, a few things here what Paul meant by living in Christ. And that you and I will begin to understand how we can live in Jesus Christ. In verses 21 through 24, he states his case for living because of his unshakable faith. He reads here, he said, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I would not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And so, in essence, what he's saying here is that living in Christ requires a strong and firm faith. Living in Christ requires a unmovable, an unshakable faith. You see, 2 Corinthians 11, 25 through 27 gives us an understanding of what Paul encountered in his life. Now, let me just pause here for a minute. When you read 2 Corinthians 11, 25 through 27, it tells you about Paul begins to explain what he encountered. 
This was a man that faced danger many times in the face, but he continued preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He talks about how he, 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 he was whipped, how he, he faced death several times, death threats. He talks about how he was shipwrecked. And this is a situation where he encountered all those problems while he was spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I would say, Lord, if I have a choice to be with you, then to stay on this earth and encounter all these problems and difficulties, I'd rather go and be with you. I don't know about you, but that's why I would say, Amen. I'm just being real. Now, some of, some of us, we have it differently, but I'm just being real. Because sometimes when you think about what you go through as Christians, the trials and the and the tribulations and the and the heartaches and the and the and the hurts and the pain, you get in a place where you say, "Lord, just take me. Let me just go and just stay with you," because these people that I'm trying to bring over to you, they don't deserve you, God. But you see, Paul understood that he had a mission. And his mission was to bring others to Jesus Christ and spread the word of God. Now, Paul, as you will, if you begin to study who Paul was, Paul's, Paul had a zeal. And the zeal he had was to kill Christians because they were not following the one true God. And he had this zeal, he had this fire in him. And he began to do that. And God realized that, you know something? I can use this man to spread my word. And so he had his Damascus experience where he met Jesus Christ. And his life changed. But you know what didn't change? It was that zeal. That zeal, Jesus, God transformed that zeal from killing Christians to converting Christians. And so, Paul was the man for the hour. If you read the New Testament, almost 75% of the books in the New Testament was written by Paul. Yes, Jesus had 12 disciples. Jesus' disciples were out there. And he had other followers. But you find that there's only few of them that wrote in the New Testament. You got the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yes, we got that. But if you look at after that, you got the book of Acts. You got Romans. You got Philippians. You got Corinthians. Paul was the one that wrote most of those books. Because God knew that he had somebody who he could trust to spread his word. And so, Paul was firm and unshakable in his faith. To live in Christ, my dear brothers and sisters, you have to be strong and unshakable and to live in Jesus Christ. We must exemplify Paul's desire that he would rather live and face all these consequences than to die and go to Christ. Galatians 2 and 20 tells us that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who die, but Christ lives in me. And life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, there is a spiritual union with Jesus Christ when we begin to live in Jesus Christ. Because our faith becomes unshakable. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 tells us that we must be steadfast, 
immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our labor is not in vain. So, to live in Jesus Christ, we must be firm in our faith. Also, to live in Jesus Christ, we must conduct our lives in a manner appropriate to the gospel of Christ. This means that we must not waver in living a Christ life, but be firm in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Paul, at this point in the letter, is addressing the situation they are encountering on the ground and is now admonishing the Philippians to become strong in the face of adversities. If you go to verse 27, he says here, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. At that particular point in time, Paul got word that the Christians in Philippi was facing adversities. And so he wrote here admonishing them that regardless of what the trials and tribulations are, they must not waver in their faith. Likewise, Paul is telling you and I that we must not waver in our faith. We must begin to trust and believe that God will take care of us. We must remain firm. We must remain strong and unshakable. Yes, we will face various trials and tribulations as Paul did. But we must not waver in our faith. Paul is admonishing his, the people, the Philippians, that, yes, I know that you all are dealing with these issues, but we must not waver in our faith. Yes, I know that we are dealing with COVID-19, but we must not waver in our faith. Yes, I know that we are dealing with a, a charged political situation in our world, in our, in our country, but we must not waver in our faith. And I love the fact that the church stood up in the face of COVID-19 when everything was shutting down. We began to, 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 to live stream and video stream. We began to do Bible studies online. We did not just sit down and wait for them to open. No, we came up with innovative ideas on social distancing in our church so that our doors can be open. I remember when I came over to, 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 and, and, and to take over the church, one of the concerns was that, Pastor, we want to come back in the church. But how could we do that? I saw the desire and the zeal. And Paul is telling you and I that we must not waver in our faith. Finally, we must be courageous. We must be courageous to live in Jesus Christ. Courage means facing adversities and still moving forward despite the consequences. Paul had many adversities. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, had many adversities. There were times that they wanted to kill him. There were times that they told lies on Jesus. But Jesus still walked in the word of God. Jesus did not waver. Jesus had the courage. I remember somewhere in scripture, they talk about where the people wanted to stone Jesus Christ. And his disciples told him that Jesus, you, don't, you should not go to that town. Jesus said, I will go. And they were waiting for him. And Jesus walked between them because he told them, he said, my time has not yet come. And when his time came, he faced a brutal death. But Jesus was courageous. And so to live in Jesus Christ, we must develop that courage. The Bible teaches us about courage, which is found in Matthew chapter 5. 
verse 11 and 12, and also 2 Timothy 2 and 12. It said, Blessed are you when men shall persecute you, for great is your reward in heaven. That is Matthew chapter 5, 11 and 12. And then in 2 Timothy 2 and 12, it said, And if you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him. You see, it is very important that we become courageous to live in Jesus Christ. Because trouble will come our way. Trouble will come our way. So, and trouble will always be there. But we must begin to live in Jesus Christ and become courageous. Isaiah reminds us in 40 and 31 that says that they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So I say to you in closing that I leave you with that particular scripture that we must wait on the Lord to live in Jesus Christ. We must be courageous to live in Jesus Christ. We must begin to understand that waiting on the Lord takes patience. Because once we wait on God, we will begin to renew our strength. And we will mount on wings like eagles. Run and not be weary. And walk and not faint. So let us live in Jesus Christ. By being firm in our faith, conduct our lives in a manner appropriate to the gospel of Christ. And overall, be courageous and continue to move forward. Amen, amen, and amen. As you've heard the word, are there any prayer concerns out there this morning? So we thank you and praise you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your word that has gone forth. And that, dear Jesus, you will continue to Bless our hearts so that we can live according to your teachings. Heavenly Father, we come now interceding for those victims of the fire out west in California and Oregon and all other places, dear God, that is facing calamities. Dear Jesus, we pray that you will be with them, Heavenly Father. Continue to console them and bless them, Heavenly Father. We pray for the for the firefighters and all those who are assisting with these fires and tornadoes and hurricanes and, and whatever else that's out there, dear Jesus, we just pray that you would be with those first responders, Heavenly Father, and all those that are coming to the aid of your people, that, dear God, you continue to bless them and keep them safe. We now present our dear brother Roy to you, God, that Heavenly Father, you will continue to, to open the way for him to receive his kidney, dear God. We know that, dear God, everything rests in your hands. So we pray for his healing, dear God. We pray that you will bless him, Heavenly Father. We know that there was a little setback, but dear God, a setback is just a setup for, your, for, for, for the good things that you have for us, dear God. And so we praise you and glorify your name, Lord. We pray that you will bless him, Lord. We pray for Sharon's mother who is dealing with cancer, dear God. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will continue to comfort her mother, dear God. You will continue to give her the strength, Heavenly Father, Lord, to overcome this, this illness, Heavenly Father. Oh, Lord God, we pray that you will be with Sharon also, Lord. Bless her heart, dear God, and give her that peace which passes all understanding. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just magnify your name and lift you up on high. We pray for our leaders in church and state. We pray that, dear God, you will continue to guide them, Lord, and lead them in the way that they will, they will continue to, to, to lead your people, Heavenly Father. Oh, dear Jesus, we magnify your name and we lift you up on high. We pray for each and every member in our congregation, dear God, that you will bless us collectively and individually. We thank you for our children, dear God, and we pray that you continue to protect us from danger seen and danger unseen. All illnesses, Lord. And all issues, Lord, 
Heavenly Father, we know that you can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ever ask of you. And now, dear Jesus, as you have taught your disciples how to pray, we are bold to say, let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil, from the eyes of the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us receive our tithes and offerings. Please remain standing for our sending forth him. This is my father's world. Please receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you as you part this place, never from his presence, living in Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>